my name's Sunil Bald, and I'll be introducing uh, the events tonight and the speakers. I'm going to keep this short and scripted, so for the benefit of both you and the speakers. Um, so, my, as I said, my name's Sunil Bald, and I was fortunate to be a member of this year's Emerging Voices jury, uh, a jury that included Harry Cobb, Susanna Drake, Mario Gooden, Carrie Jacobs, Anna Katz, Tom Pfeiffer, and Billy Chin. So as you can see, we were geographically an extremely diverse jury. We represented three of New York's five boroughs, uh, Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, and I represented Queens. So we were naturally all impressed <clears throat> by an applicant pool whose strength really was in its diversity this year. And it led to a selection of eight architects from both south of the border, north of the border, the West Coast, the Midwest, the South, the East Coast, and of course we had one from Brooklyn, uh, John Lott, who spoke last week with Heather uh, Roberge. So um, tonight, though, I'm very pleased to introduce to be introducing tonight's uh, presentations by uh, Rosanna Montiel and Omar Gandhi, which at first class glance might seem a study in contrast. Um, the bases of each of these architects, Mexico City and Halifax, are 2,679 miles apart and are arguably even more distant socially, economically, and environmentally. However, the work of both of our speakers demonstrates that relatively small acts of architecture, whether thoughtfully, when thoughtfully conceived and executed, can have a large impact on the expansive fields they engage. Indeed, their respective fields of engagement prompt us to reconsider what context actually is, not as something that's static and easily definable, but as something heterogeneous and in constant flux. This encourages multidisciplinary processes, which both of our speakers engage in in their work, and it also, I think you'll see that both architects demonstrate that you can actually find radicality uh, while still being respectful. Um, so tonight, I'm, we're gonna begin uh, with Omar and then uh, conclude with Rosanna. But before commencing, I've got some uh, thanking to do. So let me get to that. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank the Architects newspaper, and I don't know if there are copies available, but there's, as usual, a very beautiful spread of uh, the emerging voices, the architects that are participating in their work, along with some interviews. So we uh, thank them for another year of insightful coverage of, for e you know, of each of the firms that are participating. Um, additional support for the series is provided by the Next Generation Fund of the Architectural League, an annual fund supported by a group of past emerging voice winners and league prize winners. Uh, the Mexican Cultural Institute of New York, and by public funds <coughs> from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Architectural League programs are also supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council for the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew, Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And then finally, I just want to give a special thanks to um, uh, at least Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, who, you know, whose constant support makes this series possible. At least and Jeffrey are friends of architecture and also of many of us architects, and they're both real um, wonderful, tireless advocates for new voices in our field. So without further ado, we'll begin with Omar. Um, Omar Gandhi is principal of Omar Gandhi Architects. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of bachelor's degrees from University of Toronto and Dalhousie University, as well as an MR from Dalhousie University. Uh, when we look at these uh, portfolios, ones which have primarily residential work, it can be kind of a tough sell at times to the Emergent Voices jury. But Omar's work really stood out, not just for the quality of its design and construction, but kind of in creating an inventive uh, dialogue between materiality and the landscape in which his work sits. And in bringing a precision and a interesting shadow of urbanity to these projects that are in these kind of beautiful uh, Nova Scotia expansive landscapes. So uh, Omar, um, Omar will come up, give his talk, and then I'll return to introduce Rosanna.
Oh, thank you all for being here. After landing yesterday in uh, New York, I think it finally hit me after uh, finding out about this award uh, a few months ago uh, that I was going to be a part of something special like this. So for you, you know, you're here and you're watching two young architects talk about their work, but uh, I'm sure the same for Rosanna. This is definitely a major sort of highlight of my career in life. So thank you all for being here. So I grew up in Brampton, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto. Uh, and I, I'm sure it's very similar here in New York or in LA or in some of the major cities uh, in the States. Toronto sort of sees itself as uh, somewhat of a center of the universe sort of situation. So most people I grew up with in my family, they actually didn't know all that much about the rest of Canada. So when I told my parents and my friends that I had decided that I was going to move to Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is uh, on the extreme east coast of Canada, uh, it came as a pretty huge surprise uh, to most people around me. What I would say, though, is that looking back uh, at both my career and life, uh, I'd say that nothing has had more of a positive impact uh, on everything that came after. So one of those things uh, that made Halifax such a great place was the school that I went to. Um, unlike most schools of architecture, the thing that really makes Dalhousie uh, a different school was a real sort of respect for making things, actually touching lumber and learning how to swing a hammer, putting things together. And that's what we did. So just a, as a one small part of the curriculum, uh, what was really important to the school was that there'd be a part of each summer where we'd be actually out on site, we'd be out in the field somewhere in the Maritimes, and we'd, some projects were local, some we'd travel to, uh, and we'd actually make something. So it wasn't just this, this sort of abstract way of thinking about architecture, but actually thinking about the entire process. So I'm going to start here uh, with the lecture. And in 2010, after studying both at Dalhousie and the University of Toronto and working both in Toronto and Halifax sort of back and forth for years, uh, I came to a point in my career where I actually found myself out, out of a job. <laughs> Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, I could go look for one. There wasn't really a lot happening in Halifax other than the job that I had. Um, but thought, well, you know what, maybe this is sort of the opportunity uh, to try and hang my own shingle and, and start something. So there was this project that was sort of hanging in the background. Some friends of ours uh, actually uh, had said previously that, you know, uh, you know we have this old house, um, in Liverpool, Nova Scotia, which is down in the South Shore, uh, and we might want to have some work done to it. And I just thought, you know, this isn't, doesn't really sound like a sexy project, probably isn't something that I'm gonna take on, uh, but found myself sitting in my attic at the time, you know, sort of sweating about not having a job, uh, and having this, this little project that someone brought up uh, in the back of my mind. So I called them and I said, you know what, let's talk about it. So. Uh, I went to their property and took a look at it. And at that point, you know, as I'm showing pictures of my attic, what I'm not really describing is a lot of confusion. Because, you know, as I had worked in both Toronto for notorious firms and in Halifax for Brian McKay Lyons, you know, there was a, there's a real sort of clear way that those firms work. Um, and, and I guess that was something that um, had really stuck with me and thought, you know, I know how they do it. I know how I did it when I worked at these places, but you know, how am I going to do it? What's the way that I'm going to approach design and architecture? So again, uh, back to that project. Uh, so Cedar and Three Textures is the name of the project. Um, and it's really difficult for me to talk about my work um, without talking about these first three projects that I'm going to talk about. Um, just because, uh, as I'm saying, th 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 it was sort of the way in which I sort of um, went through a process of discovering and figuring out how I'm going to approach design, uh, what's going to be my way. So this is the house. Uh, it's a hundred-year-old house in uh, Liverpool, Nova Scotia. And, you know, not like a lot of places in America, a lot of places in America, uh, this is a place with an aging population, industry that's shutting down, and people are leaving. And when they're leaving, they're actually going to move to places like that I grew up in, in the suburbs of 
uh, Toronto and places like that in larger centers where there's a lot of industry and jobs available. So th this sort of like a shell of a town that was once thriving not that long ago. Uh, so it was really important um, when thinking about design to be extremely modest, uh, to be respectful of the community. Um, and although this was for the town doctor, who are obviously the most prominent people in this community, um, it was really important to me um, that we weren't flaunting of any of this. This was this. It was important to both the client and myself. So then, you know, what about design? How are we going to approach it? So, essentially, maybe because I didn't know what else to do, I just thought, well, I'm just going to absorb as much information as possible and just let the information dictate what few minor, minimal moves that I would make. Let's see what happens. So looking at these diagrams here, you can see it, the one on the left, you know, it's about kind of exposing this southern view uh, that was previously untapped. It's about uh, these viewpoints on the street that neighbors, you know, it's a small town, everybody knows everybody and everybody is also kind of in your face all the time. Um, it was really about sort of uh, minimizing what people could see, not, not to necessarily hide it from them, but also to be extremely modest. So the new portion's at the back uh, facing the water. And then on the right here, there's just a diagram about how those two parts would go together. Thinking about kind of a public space and a private space, the, the street um, view as well as kind of what would be sort of hidden in the back and maybe a new entry. So then again, dealing with what's, what's available to me in terms of information. Diagram A here is the existing uh, model, which was basically in the blue you have the existing house, and in the red you had this extremely sort of horrible, kind of poorly built addition that was built sometime in the, in the 70s or 80s. Okay, well what can we do, right? So you go to kind of the municipality and you talk about kind of setbacks and you know, what's the maximum we can build. And then in diagram C here, it's, okay, well, now we're facing south. What's really important is that we don't have spaces that are heating up and frying everybody inside. Uh, so we're creating kind of extremely passive solar shading, both in the upper level and the lower level. So in my office, and maybe this is sort of old school, um, and certainly has a lot to do with where I learned about architecture at Dalhousie and the way that education is kind of taught there, uh, we make a lot of models, you know, we make refined models, uh, we make really, really sketchy models, but this is all part of the process of developing ideas. So looking at the plan here, uh, at the bottom is actually the, the view facing the water. That would end up becoming kind of the, the new sort of private uh, entry into this new addition on the back. And so you walk up a veranda and you actually slide in the back here and as you can see with the elevation on the top left. What was really important was that there was, there was certainly some harmony between the new parts and the old parts, but I wasn't trying to make it blend. It isn't, I mean, that's one of the most sort of frustrating things about talking about additions or renovations to projects is when people say, you know, we really need it to fit in. It needs to look like, you know, I create a pretty sort of severe line that uh, tells two stories, but the story goes together. So this here from that, uh, one of those street views, you know, people drive by all the time and, you know, I think what was maybe a little bit of a test was that what we had done was almost camouflaged. It felt like it had been there forever, but it was actually something quite different. So from the back, totally hidden, and maybe this is something that was exposed only to people who uh, they were closer to or invited guests, they'd come back and they would see this sort of modern addition. The project was named Cedar and Three Textures um, because we used local cedar. Um, and I, what I tried to do to break up the massing of this, these volumes was to actually try and play with texture and texture alone. So we had two kind of vertical bands of uh, eastern white cedar uh, on the new portion and then we completely reclad um, the old portion in cedar shingles with four inch to the exposure. So what, what's really important about that project, you know, although it isn't necessarily one of the ones that I've had published or is, you know, a real benchmark in my career, was that it sort of led to everything else uh, afterwards. So 
with that previous project, what I didn't tell you was that the third person that we interviewed uh, after sort of weeks of interviewing new people and me not really knowing many people in the area, uh, the third person completely blew our mind and was certainly the best builder I had ever talked to or spoken to and, you know, essentially took the project easily. And her name is Deborah Herman Spartanelli. Uh, and obviously, you, you would imagine in a place like this, it's not that common that you would have uh, a woman builder uh, who was a builder for one and secondly, actually the best builder. Uh, and so we forged a really, really close relationship. You know, me being sort of at the beginning of my career, I was very, very open to the idea of learning from builders. I mean, builders certainly know a lot more about uh, local construction and local traditions uh, of building than I do. And so she really did teach me. Uh, and so I was a sponge for several years. And so this project uh, was actually just about 10 or 15 minutes down the road from the previous one. And she basically said to me, okay, look, there were some clients that came up to me and they said they have this old uh, kind of cottage that is on the water. Um, and they just want to do a little renovation addition. And I told them that, you know, this is her talking, I told them that I knew this really young architect who was really keen and he could probably help you out with uh, this project. So I met with them on site. And although they had sort of a huge list of things that they wanted to do, I just had this feeling that that's not really what they wanted to do. And so maybe I could present them with another idea. And so I'd say this is sort of like one of those sort of critical turning points in my career that could have actually been the last page of uh, the book. Uh, I just said, well, what about actually, you know, if we think about a new build here. We actually tear it down. You, I know you're telling me what you want to do, but that's a lot of things to do for a really old place that isn't very nice. And you, I can tell looking in your eyes that you don't actually like it very much. So they told me stories about uh, playing with their grandkids. And they were never talking about that old cottage. They were talking about the land. And they, they talked kind of at great lengths about this natural bowl that was part of the back of the property. And they said, you know, no matter what, what time of the day or what time of the year, the grandkids would come over. And everybody always sort of piles around this area. It's almost like a little stage or an auditorium or maybe like a mini kind of Nova Scotian amphitheater uh, in the back uh, 40. And I said, well, what if we just wrapped this building around that? You know, like what if it was the stage and the building wrapped around it like mother's arms, you know, grandmother's arms in this case. I said, well, what about breaking up the program? Okay, you know, what if the, you have that natural depression there and that actually led to the, uh, the existing kind of waterfront that you have, which is beautiful and you don't have real kind of clear access to right now. But you also think about kind of uh, this building being almost like a distorted sort of uh, traditional shed building that wraps around and on one wing you have uh, guest accommodations and of course on the other side you have your master wing and in the middle, that's obviously the great room, but from wherever you are in that place you're looking constantly at this little kind of natural grassy bowl in the middle. So again, it, in my de like I'm still kind of uh, in my attic kind of puttering around at this point, I'm playing with card and I'm thinking okay well you know these are the sort of ideas that I'm talking about and the things that they seem to really kind of gravitate towards when I was talking about it. You know, what if we played with heights of the roof and we actually allowed light to enter in from the sides and you have these overhangs here and you really, you know, it's one thing to talk about sort of a distorted shed building that you turn and bend, but it's another to actually physically do it and see what happens. So then the process continues. And so this is something we deal with on every project where we play with, uh, again, really rough models and then we develop it. So here I'm showing you structural models uh, when the idea is progressing. And then more kind of ideas about cladding and solar shading and the way in which uh, the property actually integrates uh, even further into the building. So the floor plan here one of the ideas about this place was that for, for many, many miles as you're driving towards this cottage, you actually, even though you're driving along the coast, you almost have no view for 
an extended period of time of that ocean. And so I wanted to continue that. So imagine just sort of driving down this property and actually just being faced with almost like a plug, you know, almost a wall that's sort of at human scale. Uh, so it's not like you're driving up to, you know, a Walmart or something, but actually this long band that still sort of holds back the view completely, kind of building a drama. And so the idea was you would actually slide uh, here into one of the flaps. And you actually go along this flap here, and this is the entry. Uh, and the idea along that entry was I would, you know, this was really sort of playing with kind of these sort of phenomenological kind of atmospheric, really, really simple ideas of light and shadow and about acoustics and feeling compression. So I thought, well, what would be amazing in the kind of the great room space is the openness and the brightness and this incredible view. Well, what would be sort of the opposite? So I, I squished it down so that the ceiling height was only seven feet like Frank Lloyd Wright would do. And I baffled the ceiling so that the acoustics would actually change dramatically uh, as you enter into that little wing. So, Again, this is, I guess, the second project that I'd worked on, but, and I hope this never ends, there is nothing in my studio that makes us happier than being on site. And it really isn't about checklists and being tough on builders and all, you know, the sort of thing that you think of when architects are doing construction administration. I can't actually hide, and it's probably a problem, I can't hide how excited I am to see these ideas that started with a card model on my desk as sort of like, you know, a curveball that you pitch to uh, a client that isn't expecting it and actually seeing them, you know, building this, you know, it's hard to believe. And so I'm there all the time and most of the time as a fan, believe it or not, and seeing this thing come together. And then as the construction is progressing, you know, those ideas that I talked about in those kind of early sketches about light and contrast and drama and kind of withholding kind of information and sort of the, the peak of this story, you know, you can see them coming together. Ideas about texture and materiality, about using local materials. You know, I think that's like a real major thing with my practices. You know, we try and do the most that we can using things that are extremely common. Builders understand it, you know. They may never have done uh, a modern piece of architecture before, but it doesn't matter because I just don't use words like that. You know, I'm talking about cedar and I'm talking about kind of local wood. I'm talking about local stone, right? I'm talking about gables and hips. And so from this, you know, we get to this and, you know, those ideas and kind of that process and the joy of watching these kind of things come together, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And so here, this, this is an image of kind of the entry side and when I was talking about human scale and, uh, you know, while on the other side uh, facing the water, you actually have kind of this grand view. It was really important to me to kind of really, really accentuate the horizontality and the lowness and the longness of that entry side to welcome people. Over here we have inlaid stone kind of interwoven between local cedar and this twisting fireplace. And of course there's kind of these cool kind of little nuggets that are in these projects, but I think those just make it a little bit sweeter. It's really about kind of these larger ideas of architecture, really simple ideas. Now, you know, this is, it's probably cheesy that I'm showing pictures of my clients really happy, but <laughs> it, it, it isn't really about that because what you might be able to tell is I'm actually happier than them, you know? Like this is a process where these people, for some unknown reason, I don't know why, uh, decided to trust someone who had never kind of gone through this process by themselves before, and you know, as a result, you know, had a huge sort of impact on my life. Uh, and so that's Deborah next to me as well. So, you know, th th it's about relationships really, and it's about kind of building this sort of trust uh, between people. So, you know, you see a lot in architecture about kind of the final glowing images, but for me it's about the building and, and kind of uh, the relationships that we build. 
So the third project, again, is, is sort of connected, and that's why I keep these things tied together. Uh, as a result of those first two that I built with uh, Deborah, there was a, a wonderful article that was written in the Globe and Mail, Canada's uh, national newspaper, uh, about this sort of, I guess you could say, uh, you know, unexpected sort of relationship between two people uh, who are building kind of little special things in a small community that doesn't normally have a lot of good news coming out of it. Um, and so I got a call one day, and she actually got a call uh, the same day from the husband, and I got a call from the wife, who basically said, look, our kids are grown now, um, and we've been waiting basically our entire sort of lives uh, to build an artist studio. So uh, Peg and Garth Moore, um, basically they studied art all through school and at some point decided, you know what, we just need to sort of shelve this for, um, you know, until our kids are grown and we need to put them through school. And uh, so they basically put their dreams on hold. And so this project is really about sort of reconnecting with sort of those youthful dreams. So they gave me a call and we walked the site together, uh, a beautiful sort of forested site, which is pretty rare because most of the projects I do and most of the land that people buy are usually on the coast uh, in this part of the world. But this was really kind of uh, pushed into the woods and was, you know, it was obvious to me right from the get-go that this was really about sort of disengaging from the city and disengaging from people and really sort of focusing on craft again and being alone. And so we, as we were walking the site, we actually found this beautiful mound uh, where the land actually sort of raised up and sort of there was a bit of a plateau that dropped off again. And I just thought, well, this is, you know, there's something really special about this right here. You know, what if we thought about the gable that they kept talking about? You know, they keep uh, referring to kind of a traditional sort of barn building uh, with a pitch roof and really simple and how could we do something uh, both minimal and slightly modern uh, for their studio and I said well what if we nestle it into this hill here and so like we always do we started playing with card models you know let's say that this was the thing here and you know I'm, I'm again taking information from them what do you want to use the space for? What's going to happen upstairs? Where do you need solar protection? What are the views going to be about? And really it was about a process of kind of flipping, flapping, pushing, pulling uh, this gable model until there was something really simple uh, and intelligible about kind of the end product. And so in the end, this ended up becoming a 12-12 uh, a gable pitch uh, building that had two levels, one level open to the back uh, rear of the lot and one that just had a continuous band of windows that essentially looked at a forest. And it, it's interesting because it almost was as if that band of windows was evidence or a tool to maybe show how alone they actually were. You know, it's one thing to know you're alone, but to actually see it was something else. So this, this project here was built into this mound, and on the lower level, you got the kitchen and the great room, and you have the bedrooms. And then there's this kind of back stair uh, clad in plywood um, that actually takes you up to this studio space. And that was really going to be where they were going to spend most of their time. So again, this fashion, fascination with construction. You know, I'm there all the time and I'm taking photos and I'm just, you know, there's something wonderful about smelling cedar uh, and hearing the saws and this activity. Maybe it's just because I have a hard time usually believing that they're actually building the things that start off as such rough ideas. And then watching it craft come together, uh, you know, such simple things like little strips of wood and seeing people kind of meticulously, almost like they're trying to prove it to themselves or to the people around them that they could do something that precise and that careful. And then this is the stairwell, literally clad in the most basic plywood you could possibly imagine with the most basic kind of strip commercial lighting uh, that was really meant to be, you know, 
a space to almost transform you or uh, uh, almost like a, a washing mill that actually just changed the way you feel as you walked up through this long corridor. The thing about this project was these were empty nesters who had previously actually lived in a basement in the north end of Halifax. So this is not wealthy clients here. These were people like, you know, my parents or my, you know, the people I grew up with, regular people who just had sort of the ambition to do something special, something architectural, but simple. And so we found those raw materials. Like I said, the plywood and how can we play with really, really kind of simple ways of texturing material by playing with different widths. Uh, you know, the hanging lights here are not sort of those really fancy hanging lights that you see in stores. There was actually a bulb attached to a wire. Uh, and then this metal grate up here, which would be um, the screen uh, protecting you from the upper studio level uh, down to the great room space. And what was really cool about that was I spent an entire day with the builder just rummaging through the back pile of the metal shop just not far from my office until we found something that was... It was perfect. So again, the ideas are so simple. I mean, this is not far off from kind of those early models that we made about a strip window and kind of folding in or pleating kind of the roof to allow enough light into that clear story space. That's it. The building seemingly climbs up the hill and really just has this uh, really, really delicate uh, two-width kind of texture of cedar wrapping around this thing that every time I go back is more and more gray, uh, which is beautiful. So the roof and the walls actually at this point are almost kind of the same color. And then on the inside, plywood, concrete, little, little bits of drywall, but I tried not to use any of that. And then those kind of strips up here for lighting they were literally just boxes of plywood that we put, you know, the most regular incandescent bulb in to create this kind of elegant effect using the most basic kind of things at hand. Now, what I didn't tell you about this project, uh, this project was that the builders, you know, I, I think that that's what really was lucky about these first projects was I came and I stumbled upon these people that were really special. And in this case, every one of the builders was actually in their 20s. And what is really special about this uh, photo for me was that on that last day when we were wrapping up, and that's the client in the front, every single one of those people brought a little camera because they were dying to show their family and their friends what they had been working on for the last six months. And so there was a real sort of sense of pride in pushing yourself and crafting something the best that you could. So at this point, after the first three projects, I'm thinking, you know, maybe I do have a way of working. You know, maybe I do, like, let's see if we can kind of continue this. So this idea of adaptation. So our projects often begin with a simple local precedent, often a hip roof or gable form. The form is then extruded up or across, bent or flattened, the roof planes folded and pleated. Sculpted by conditions and use, the reconstituted adaptation is receptive and responsive in its keeping with a modest formal lineage. So that was it. That was sort of the, the toolbox that I was going to play with for the next several years. So this is all between 2010 and 2011. And so I pursued those sort of basic ideas with a lot of the projects that were coming down the mill. So after moving out of the attic, I actually had a chance to move from a few spaces, so moved kind of into one larger spot where I was able to hire one or two people, and then moved again in 2014 where I was able to hire a few more. So it, things kind of changed pretty rapidly. And so from those first three projects after five years, there was sort of a, a scattering of projects completely around the province. So that's sort of what I mean by those first three sort of setting everything off. And so this is a variety of projects since 2010 that I've worked on uh, and are now completed. But what was really important to me was to talk about two others that I think um, really sort of tell the story of my practice and the way that we work. Um, and I think you'll like it. So Rabbit Snare Gorge uh, 
is basically this incredible piece of land uh, in Cape Breton, um, which is you know, kind of the northeastern tip of Nova Scotia. Um, one of the most beautiful places, if you haven't been, you need to go there. I don't know if you guys saw in the New York Times, but they actually had a big ad rolling out the red carpet for all Americans who actually want to flee uh, the US. Um, <laughs> I think that that's still open. Uh, and so this project, what was incredible was I was just sitting there in my office working and I got a phone call from these young guys uh, from New York, Design Base 8, uh, John, John and Garrett, and basically they said, you know, we have uh, a family friend we're working on a little project for, uh, and he has this incredible piece of land uh, in Inverness, Nova Scotia, and we're wondering, you know, we just graduated, we were wondering if you could help us, we could kind of work on this together. And so, just to give you a bit more of an idea of Cape Breton, um, this is Cape Breton, so you should visit Cape Breton <laughs> and maybe consider moving there. Um, so they had already sort of spoke to the client uh, at this point and talked a little bit about the land and about this incredible, beautiful valley that existed through the property right here. So this valley with several streams and a waterfall that's over here. Uh, and then right at the edge, you actually have kind of, you know, a 50-foot, maybe more, uh, cliff face, like the image I showed you before. So there's this real sort of adventure about uh, looking through this valley of trees um, towards the water. And so we found this little mound right here that actually felt completely like, you know, this, this could be the perfect spot to actually put a little tower-like building, a cute little thing that, you know, from different levels you'd get different vantage points, and the top level, kind of like the eagle's nest, would kind of look through this valley of trees and you would look out towards the water. So again, this game, uh, you know, how much height do we need? How many levels? You know, we want one bedroom and we want uh, to have kind of a, a pretty small footprint for, you know, uh, a great room, living, dining space, and a place to just sit and look out. Uh, this client, Kevin Briotti, uh, who's here tonight, uh, is from New Jersey. So this really wasn't a place that was going to be used very often. This was actually going to be a place that would be used seasonally. And when he went there, uh, he'd probably be sitting up top and looking out at this view. So again, this game of pleading and uh, folding and uh, massaging kind of the overall cuts into this form until we had something that we were quite proud of. So sort of like an extended gable uh, that had sort of these different viewing platforms and then a little walkout balcony uh, from the great room kitchen level. One of the challenges of this project was this part of the world actually has some of the most intense winds uh, in North America, and so it was a real challenge, uh, not struggle, but challenge to work with the structural engineer to actually make sure that this thing didn't move too much and didn't crack things on the inside. Uh, and so it, it was a little bit of an exercise. And so again, it's not just sort of overall models we make, but we actually make these sort of structural models uh, that demonstrate some of those ideas. Now this is uh, in Cape Breton, and I, I took this photo because I wanted to show one sort of uh, precedent that really stuck with me kind of before this project came along, and that was these really weird kind of tack on, uh, almost like wind blocks that get posted on the front door. Maybe it's so that they can light a cigarette and, you know, the wind isn't going to uh, blow it out, or maybe it's just about the driving rain. Uh, it was really just this little protection that gets kind of added on, and it's usually made of plywood or, you know, something really simple and not very elegant. And I just, I went to the client, and I talked to the, the boys at Design Base 8, and I just said, well, what if, what, you know, this is another one of those sort of what ifs, this could go wrong. Um, what if we actually put this humongous Corten steel hoop uh, that's 22 feet high and weighs two tons, and it's a half inch thick, um, and we actually posted that on the front of the building, and this really was almost like a, a mannerist detail um, that really sort of changed the scale. You know, you step on this thing and you feel like you're going not into this little tall cabin, but you actually feel like this is, this is a special place. And 
And so this is the project, uh, you know, sitting on top of this little hill. Uh, those stripes at the back here uh, were meant to almost kind of accentuate or demonstrate kind of traditional framing. So we didn't do anything with those window holes. We actually just used the 16 inch kind of width uh, dimension that already existed. And we played with kind of a pattern that not only um, looks beautiful on the outside, but was more about an experience when climbing the stairs on the, on the inside. So this project is wrapped again in local cedar. Uh, you can probably tell by kind of the things I'm talking about. We use local materials, things that are there at that store just down the road. Uh, and we try and do the most beautiful thing we can with it. And in this case, it's about these vertical strips once again that create almost like a wooden jacket around this thing. And then on the inside, we have this, this uh, I guess, little divider that actually shoots up from the ground floor all the way up to the top. And it's almost like a, you know, an anchor into this uh, building um, that is somewhat of a, the core. So you have this drywall uh, kind of bar that slices right down into the middle of the project. Uh, and aside from that, everything is sort of like a higher grade uh, birch plywood and concrete floor again, and again, these hanging lights. So similar to that Moore Studio project, this is sort of like the step up in refinement. Now what's really interesting about this project, I think beyond that project, was that we sort of thought at some point about this cabin as being maybe one of a series of almost like creature-like pods in this landscape. Uh, and again, this takes an incredible client to have kind of the openness and kind of the participation to do something like this, but you know, we started playing with, again, these adapted sort of regional forms. You know, what could we do? We need a boat shed. We need a place to do, you know, to make things, you know, a little workshop. And then out by the water, we actually need kind of a moment, an event to actually uh, proceed to um, where you can experience that kind of insane cliff and kind of endless view uh, of the Cape Breton landscape. And so the second project uh, in that family uh, was just recently built, which was the boat shed. Um, and I think it's probably even more nuts than the last one um, because, as you can tell, we have a lot of fun. So this, this is the boat shed workshop that's completely clad in that same wood again with an internal sort of uh, steel structure. Um, but And this is my son's favorite part it's actually kind of built like a transformer. So you have kind of these camouflage doors that actually bifold open and then a huge drawbridge out the mouth of this thing that kind of just slides and that's where you walk up with your, your kayak. So. so finally, I'm gonna talk about float. Um, this is probably the closest project to Halifax, so it was actually nice to be uh, fairly local um, when kind of reviewing this and talking to the client. This was actually a re repeat client that I had done a little renovation for, uh, who, you know, kind of always told me, you know, this is really fun that we're doing this, but hold on, I'm gonna buy a piece of land and we're gonna do something special together. Uh, and so she did find a piece of land. A, land. a piece of land that probably most people wouldn't necessarily find attractive, um, but we both saw it together. And so this is just outside of Halifax and it's in this, incredible glacial valley that's literally just kind of like nails kind of scribing the land and have led, left these massive bedrock outcroppings uh, in the landscape. The landscape is literally used for mountain biking and hiking uh, and part of it is crown land. But other than that, people just really don't imagine this as a place to live. And so we started playing with sketches and diagrams and how we could break up the program of this thing uh, you know, by imagining it in parts. So her kids have grown up and they're actually, you know, sort of in the house and sort of kind of away at school. 
you know, how could we play with these volumes so that, you know, when they're not there, we could maybe shut things down? Uh, how could we play with these volumes so that it gets the most amount of light where it's important and the best view where it's important? So it was really about composition in this landscape. Um, but probably the most kind of dynamic part of this site was this gigantic bedrock outcropping um, that we decided was going to be the backdrop to this house. I mean, this isn't like some rocks. This is, these are gigantic boulders uh, and rock coming from the landscape that literally would become kind of the most intimate space of this house and we would use as sort of the anchor And so this composition, it went from boxes to actually tapered volumes, tapered both in plan and in section. And then, you know, we always have to have our little fun part of this as well. We, we talked about the roof. Well, what if the roof actually just popped open? You know, almost like, you know, the, the headlights of like an IROC Z or a Camaro or something, where you actually allow some light in, and in the evening you actually allow some light out. And so this is that landscape. Massive boulders looking out at, at a completely sort of untapped, uh, mostly crown land um, landscape where you're looking at a kind of a succession of lakes here and then you actually see the ocean in the background. So as you're walking down the driveway and driving up here, we played with the idea of thinking about these volumes uh, as rock themselves, so you know, actually walking through uh, little passageways and little gaps and kind of turning corners here. Uh, and so the idea here is you actually walk up the driveway and the entry is between these massive volumes that's kind of reading like a, a massive kind of uh, wooden void between here. Um, and then in section, we wanted to play with the landscape literally as it was, so you know, as you're going from one uh, programmatic space to the next, you were actually navigating. You're actually climbing up these things. So n none of these rooms are flat side by side. So you're constantly almost meandering through this space as if the house wasn't there. And this was you navigating on top of the existing landscape. And so this is float. So what was, I guess, you know, part of the exercise here was to play with wood and maybe tinting it uh, to almost read as if it really was um, part of this bedrock outcropping or float, which is basically the term of uh, bedrock which has been severed or broken off and actually moved from its or original space. So by looking kind of from further away, you actually get very similar color tints between these things, and it actually does feel and look like maybe this had been there forever. And then we played with porosity as well. So sure, these are meant to kind of feel and look like massive uh, stereotomic volumes, but we played with the idea of actually ghosting or allowing light to kind of filter in and out through this shed. So not only do you have a composition of things at different levels in section and plan, but you, you also have uh, a playfulness with respect to uh, the transparency or porosity of these things. And so in the dining space here, which is meant to be kind of that intimate space, I mean, you're constantly confronted with uh, this wall of rock uh, that's so tall that you wouldn't be able to climb it if you wanted to. Um, and so you feel really kind of uh, nestled in. And on the inside, maybe it was the playfulness. We wanted to think of 
the inside as being, you know, like a kinder egg kind of thing where you have this warm sort of interior where we played with walnut and warm woods, uh, much like the entryway, which is meant to read almost like uh, a dark wooden void between these volumes. Now, I put this photo in here. It's actually for a kind of funny reason, but uh, Jeff, who's right here, uh, he's been with me for the most uh, length of time. And after work, sort of like after school, uh, he makes these bikes. And so he's built a company where he makes these kind of custom cafe racers. And so it was really important to me to celebrate the work that he had done uh, kind of in his own time, uh, maybe as a token of my kind of appreciation for what he does in my office. But the funny part is somehow he also weaseled his way into the photo. Um, and so you actually see images of, uh, of the bike and, and of the project uh, quite often with him sitting in the front on his bike. So it, it all sort of backfired on me. But. So I always, I always complete my lecture by thanking the people who work with me. Um, for some reason, architects often like making this feel like it's this sort of masterful sort of, you know, folding papers, you know, napkin sketch sort of thing. But, you know, it isn't like that, at least in my office. Uh, I hire the smartest, kind of most wonderful people I can. And any idea that we're talking about, we always talk about as a group. So um, I just wanted to thank you all uh, for being here. This means a lot. <laughs>